Palm Sunday is a good example of he never stops working. Because we think, whoa, everything turned out wrong. But uh, it's interesting. We won't start the sermon. Okay, tomorrow night, everybody knows is prayer. And so if you have any prayer requests, let's uh, bring those, put those in the basket with tithes and offerings. Praise reports. We have a number of praise reports. And so praise God for what he's doing in our body, the healing that he's doing, jobs that people are finding. Carol's got something to add to my announcements. We also have prayer on Saturday night. I apologize, Carol, because it's further down in my notes. I, I, uh, I try to uh, give them both uh, special announcements. So 4 o'clock on Saturday, we also have intercessory prayer. And uh, so, Carol, and that's back in the back room, and both of them might be there. I'm not sure. So br- put your prayer requests in. They will get double prayed for. And our God answers prayer, amen? amen. And uh, no, I, won't, I won't go there. Uh, that song, He Never Lets Me Down. How many of you ever, hey, hey, I thought God's let me, I, there's been times in my life, I'm sure God let me, I thought God let me down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Last election. I heard lots of people say, I... God said, I talked to God about this. I talked to God about this. And God said, well, let me guess what, folks. Bible says if you do that and you say God said, God told you, and you speak in God's name, he says if they speak in my name, you don't have to listen to them anymore. Because they'll be dead. Because you are supposed to stone them. Well, it's the New Testament. You, know, you sort of guess and guess. Well, I guess that's pretty unique. But you know, I don't know, there's a lot of things in my life where I prayed and I expected God to do something and He didn't do it the way I wanted it. And I felt God let me down. God's never let us down. He's always upholding us. All things work together for good to those that love the Lord and called according to His purposes. It's not about what I want. It's about what God's got designed. Palm Sunday is a great illustration of that. Uh, Next Sunday... We are going to have an Easter egg hunt for the little kids. High school will take care of it as usual. That's how you delegate. Um, And they are learning to be servants. And so if you want to drop off some filled eggs or you want to drop off some candy or you want to uh, drop it off, because Thursday night the high school department's going to, and then they're going to take care of it. They're going to learn how to serve a little bit more. Amen? And so uh, that'll be good. We have, and so that's at 6.30 on Thursday night, 6 to 8.30, it's behind me, I'm not looking at my notes, I should have done better, okay, there we go, uh, they got work to do, uh, men and women's uh, Bible studies are over for a short season, um, write me a note and, or something, I'm putting together, I'm thinking about putting together um, it, what, the, what the Bible says about end times. Not just about what it says it's going to be, but what's going to, what is to be our uh, attitude going into the end times. What's, what's the Bible say that the end times are going to look like? Now, if you don't think this is the end times, um, probably haven't read your Bible too much. But then again, you go back every single generation just about thought it, they lived in the end times. So what... what I think we need to rejoice that God's in charge and he's never going to let us down. He's got this thing planned and he's known. But, you know, we have a participant. We are part of the end times. So we've each got an assignment to do. And so I'm thinking about putting together a series for Wednesday nights on that. So let me know if you, because it's going to take a lot of studying and work. So if you're interested, let us know. Eight o'clock. Saturday morning, men's breakfast. It's the first, uh, the men's group and women's groups are uh, finished for a short season. Men's breakfast, there we go. Eight o'clock. Bacon, sausage, eggs, cheese. 
Hash browns. What? We can have poached eggs, yeah. So anyway, bring a friend. It's a good time for men to gather together, eat, and uh, share time together and share experiences. Next Sunday is Easter. Everybody bring a friend. You know, it's, we will definitely have a salvation message because Easter's about salvation. Easter's about the victory that Christ won for us. Today is about um, Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is one of those Sundays throughout my life reading the Bible. I've often thought, what were they thinking? What were they thinking? On Sunday, they're throwing down their cloaks, palm leaves, and they're shouting, Hosanna, son of David, the Messiah. On Friday, they're shouting, crucify him. How many times in our life have we said, we thought how God should work something out? Here's how God should do it. Here's how God should do it. Here's how God. I, this is how I interpret what God is saying. And we're all excited and we broadcast it and we get on that bandwagon and all of a sudden it doesn't work out. Has that ever happened to any besides me? Yeah. Where you just, this is what, this is God's word. I mean, I'm praying. <laughs> Excuse me, um. Do I need to remind you, you know, how I interpret your word and you've got to act according to how I interpret your word? <laughs> Palm Sunday is such a Sunday. Matthew 21. Triumphal entry. Now when the crowd grew near Jerusalem and came to Bethlehem or Bethanage on the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey a colt, with a colt with her. Loose them, then bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, tell the daughter of Zion's, Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and seated on a, sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. I got to tell you, I have been perplexed almost, well, ever since I was reading Passover Sunday, Palm Sunday, how people could be so fickle in their following God. I mean, how could they? I mean, it just... Sunday, they're declaring their love and their allegiance, their faith for Jesus. Do you have a picture of that? Did Kodak give us a Kodak moment there? And declare their love and allegiance, faith for Jesus, their Messiah, and then on Friday, call for his crucifixion. I pray that this uh, sermon that I've put together um, is going to help serve you better understand their turmoil, and some of the turmoil that some of us may be feeling at times. Helping us how to stand in faith when our expectations of what God is going to do doesn't materialize as we believe it should. Amen? I tell people, do you pray for the sick? People ask me, do you pray for the sick? All the time, God heals. Well, do they always get healed? No. Nope. It's not, see, healing's not up to me. Healing's up to God. Went through a season in my ministry where I was really feeling that we needed to pray more for the sick. And so I was praying more for the sick. And uh, they kept dying. And I thought, what in the world? And one guy got, I thought, cured of cancer and Died a few weeks later after the doctors told him he was cured. I mean, I shouted, God's healing, healing's in our, you know. And God's a healing God, and I've seen people survive cancer by God's hand. But I've also seen people die that I prayed for. 
So maybe some of you are thinking, well, I'll get somebody else. Um, <laughs> but I'll send my spouse. No. <laughs> but the reality is that history is his story, not ours. And nothing explains it better for me than when we truly understand what happens between Sunday on Palm Sunday and the triumphal entry and Friday when the crowd starts shouting crucify him. The same people who had been disappointed. The temple would have been the center of Passover activity. How many of you think the temple is just this large place? It's called the Temple Mount or the Temple Compound. It, it, it is over 30 acres. Well, well there's just this temple. No, no, no. There's 30 acres with multiple activities going on. And Tony's fortress, the Roman garrison, is built adjacent to the temple compound. From there, the Romans could have a vantage point to keep an eye on the Jews to show them who was in charge and remember, and for them to remember what happens to people who disturb the Pax Romana. Frustration in following God often happens because he isn't doing our expectations. They built their Roman compound, they built their Roman barracks, so they could watch over this large-scale Jewish facility. It's there because they knew Jews are temperamental, that during their religious holidays, they have a tendency to rise up. And they wanted them to understand, our garrison fronts your temple compound. And our front doors, we can be on you. Like bird on a bug. It was there to intimidate the citizens of Jerusalem who might think about joining some sort of rebellion against the Romans. And it was built there after somebody did. After Herod the Great died in 4 B.C., a rebellion started just five miles from Jesus' hometown of Nazareth. It happened to be the capital of Galilee at the time, Sepphoris. Romans came in, they burned Sepphoris, and they burned Emmaus to the ground. They took anybody rising up against them real serious. So after that happens, they march into Jerusalem. They subdue the city cruelly. And then they said, okay, anybody have any concept, idea, or thinking about going against us, we are going to go out here and we are going to crucify 2,000 of you. Which they did. Then they said, now we're going to build a Roman garrison right next to your Temple Mount. Because we're going to keep a good eye on you. We're going to teach you. You have the governor of Judea, Samaria, Idum, a man named Pontius Pilate. He's got his palace over on the, sea of Met the Mediterranean Sea. And it is really a nice place. It's Caesarea by the sea. It's uh, a palace. And he loves it there because it's warm, Ocean breeze off the Mediterranean. Beautiful. Have you ever been to the Mediterranean or Caesarea by the sea? It's gorgeous. He's got a great palace there. But he knows, oh man, I got to go back to that stinking, dirty, crowded city, Jerusalem. Why? Because he knew as a Roman governor, 
he needed to be in the capital, which was Jerusalem of Judea, capital of Judea. He needed to be there at their high holy days. Why? Because that's when they did. That's when they decided they were going to fight the Romans. So what most people don't understand, and I, I found from a book I found a few weeks ago, it's the book called The Last Week. And it's by historians Bork and Croson's. And from Roman historical records, the governor of Judea, Pontius Pilate, left his preferred capital headquarters in Caesarea by the sea, and he traveled with, Romans, with Rome's contingent of soldiers. They needed to be in Jerusalem to display their power and their might. So imagine the spectacle of his entry. He comes in from the west. Jesus is going to come in from Gethsemane, the east. He's coming in. He's riding his horse. He's got his flowing robes. Regal as always. Pontius Pilate leads his Roman soldiers on horseback. And they come by the hundreds and hundreds on foot. Each soldier is clad in leather armor, polished to a high gloss. On each centurion's head, hammered helmets are gleaming in the bright sunlight. At their sides, shield in their scabbards, are swords crafted from the hardest steel. And in their hands, each centurion carries a spear, or if he's an archer, a bow with a sling of arrows across his back. There's rows of drummers and trumpeters that beat so the soldiers walk in time. And they mass through the west gate, displaying all their power. They know Holy Week for the Jews are coming. Why is, why is he there? Why is Pilate there? Because he knows for the Jews, Passover is when they got liberated out of Egypt. He knows this is a holiday that they're going to cry again for freedom. In the book, The Last Week, he talks about how Pilate isn't really a bad guy. He's just a weak one. So he comes in surrounded by his Roman guards and legions. Every one of them is on display. You ever see a man in uniform, a military uniform? How about it? I did a wedding a few years ago for some people, and he was a Marine officer candidate. All his friends who were at the wedding were Marine officers. His brother was a Coast Guard officer, and he had flown in from Japan. And I remember thinking, wow, uh, uh, he was a CB officer, and he said, man, they need to pick up their uniforms. Because I'll tell you what, that troop of young men in the groom's party were poster boy Marines. I mean, buzz cut. Every one of them stepping out of a gym someplace. Everything that could gleam on their uniforms gleamed. Their swords. They, did, they crossed the swords for after the wedding. It was, it was impressive, i got to tell you. If I'm a little kid looking at what military unit to go into... Man, I'm just going to look at the dress uniforms. <laughs> but I was really impressed because they were picking over each other. They just, there wasn't a piece of lint anywhere. They looked like a formidable group of men, and they were. But think about these Roman soldiers. Polished. Erect. disciplined, 
marching by the hundreds into the west gate, keeping time with the drummers that are drumming and the horns. And at the, to at the front of them is, is Pontius Pilate on his horse. What they're saying is, don't even think about it. Don't even think about it. We know you celebrate this time as the time when you were deli delivered from the kingdom of Egypt. You're not going to get delivered from the kingdom of Rome. At the same time that Pontius Pilate is coming through the west gate, Jesus comes through the east gate. Jesus is not riding a charger or riding in a chariot. He's riding on a fold. Not even a donkey. A little donkey. A colt. His feet are probably dragging. But the people have heard what he has done. It's already begun to be circulated that he's the son of David to come. It's already been circulated. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded. And they brought the donkey and the colt. And they laid their clothes on him and, he sent, and they set him on the colt. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Where others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the multitudes who went out before and those who followed kept crying out, Hosanna, save us. Save us. Hosanna is not so much a word that says, Oh boy! It's a plea. Save us. Save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. In the highest. Two processions in the same day. Pilate's procession is meant to show of military strength and might. You fall in line or you will be paying a price. Both Matthew and Mark record Jesus' entry. Tell the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, a colt, a foal of a donkey. See, the people have heard Zechariah's promise. They understand what's promised. They have the, he, he's, your Messiah's coming. And he's going to do these mighty works for God. And they've already seen his miracles. They've already heard of all the other things. They already know Lazarus has been laid, raised from the dead. He's going to do a couple more miracles while during this week. They're expecting something great at the end of this week. They're expecting when the votes are tallied, righteousness wins. We get to come back, the king of David, the son of David, to having a king. They remember Zechariah 9, the promise. The prophet reassures the people of Judah that God has not forgiven, forgotten them. But I will defend my house against marauding forces. Never again will an oppressor overrun my people. For now I am keeping watch. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous, and having salvation. Gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem and the battle bow will be broken on the other end of town. There are chariots and there are horses and there are battle bows and there is drums and there is gleaming as the Romans intimidate or attempt to. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. 
Everybody understands Zechariah 9. They know what Jesus has been doing. But see, often we hear what we want to hear. Amen? We hear what we want to hear. Rather than hear what the Lord is saying. We make words what we want them to be. That's why I tell you, if you're ever in a discussion with somebody, make sure that you define the words. There's lots of labels people put on people. I told you a few weeks ago I was with a, debating someone who is about as different on every spectrum than I am. And we'd go back and forth, and I'd say, well, how do you define that term you just used? How do you define it? I had Kathy read it because I felt I was getting out of hand because uh, I was getting blood pressure up. You know. And she said, hey, it's good. Oh, by the way, I didn't tell you. When I sat back and I said, I want you to define, and don't you define, and I said, you give me a definition and I will give a definition. And by the way, the definition you just gave me what you're accusing me of shows that you are just what you called me. Because your only, your, your only opinion, your only way you're labeling me is because how I was born. And I said, so, and, and I went, and then I said, now let's define this right. And, and all of a sudden, click. Uh-oh. And we'd gone back and forth for about an hour, and I thought, what's wrong with this computer? <laughs> what's, Josh! No, 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 he deleted me. <laughs> and I just remember thinking, you know, it, we have to make sure we understand that God's in charge. Amen? See, what the, here's what they heard. Our Messiah is coming back. Those Romans coming over there in the West Gate, marching with drums and all the instruments of war. By the way, what made the Roman army so great? They were standardized. That's what made the Roman army. One of the great things, the discipline and the way they were standardized. You got a standardized sword. Everything could be replaced immediately. You didn't have to go keep looking for it. Everything was done standardized. It wasn't until they began to allow people to just bring in whatever they wanted. And, you know, hey, I really work better with a club. Well, don't take a knife to a gunfight. But they were overcoming in with their mastery, and the Jews were here. And this is the promise, like David. David wiped out all the enemies. God did it for him. They're hearing, all right, God's going to deliver the nation from the oppressor. That's what he said. In this case, it was Rome. Then after the king is installed and the Romans are kicked out, he's going to rule humbly. King David, God said about King David, he's a man after my own heart. He's not going to be a warrior on a steed of war, but a slow-moving donkey, the symbol of a king who comes to present Two processions could not have been more different in the message they conveyed. Pilate leading the Roman centurions asserts the power and the might of the Roman Empire, which crushes into oblivion any that oppose it. Jesus riding on a young donkey embodies the peace and the tranquility, the shalom that only God can bring to a people. See, they still were hanging on to the fact that Whoa, we're going to have power. We're going to have dominance. We're going to be an authority. 
And Jesus says, no. No, I'm the king of peace. What do we do when God doesn't answer things the way we want them? Those who watched that day had to make a choice. They would either serve the God of this world, might and power, or they choose to fight, serve the king of a different kind of a kingdom. Jesus makes a lot of enemies in this week. I mean, he's already made some. What's he do? He goes into Jerusalem and he heals a blind man. How does he heal the blind man? Thy sins, you're, you're, you're forgiven of your sins. I forgive you. You can't do that. We're the priest, we're the establishment. You can't do that. Only we, as representatives of God, can take your money and give you absolution. See, he does that. that, that if you read in Matthew and in Mark and also in John there, that's what takes him off. Now, and, and, and this the second time he cleans, uh, he cleanses. You know, we say the temple, you always think it was just... No, he goes to the part of the temple where's the, where the proselytes or the Greeks or the non-believing Jews, the, 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 the non-Jewish people who believe in the Jesus, they receive what, what the Jewish people have as, as a God and rules, and they convert. And God said, now they can't go into the temple. But let's put a place on the temple mount ordered by God where they can pray. Well, because of how the chief priest, the Sanhedrin, felt, they turned that place into a marketplace. History and numerous accounts tell us what a crooked marketplace it was. The Bible says that when you come <coughs> to your offer the sacrifice, it should be without spot or blemish. You, so you could have a little lamb and it wouldn't have a spot on it. Nothing wrong with it. You could bring it in. <laughs> Sorry, but it doesn't pass mustard. Going to have to buy a new one. Well, what do you give me for it? 50 cents. You got one that I can buy? Yeah, it'll be a couple of bucks more. Okay. Because you've got to have the animal for the sacrifice for your sins to be forgiven, right? So you do it. You pocket the money. Next guy comes in. Here's my perfect little lamb for the sacrifice. <laughs> not going to do. Not going to do. Why not? You wouldn't understand these things. I'm more spiritual than you. So, same process. Except what they would do is They'd sell the lamb that they took that was inferior and sell it to the next guy down the line. That's why Jesus is, turns it upside down, drives them all out, and he says, this is supposed to be a house of prayer. This area is designed by God for prayer. This is the only place these people can pray. These people have, have been proselyted. They've come into the Jewish faith. They seek Yahweh. Now, Jews, sons of Abraham, you can go into the temple area. But they can't. This is all they have. This is where they come to pray. And you've turned it into a scam. The Bible's clear in both places. Both times he turned their tables over. But the second time he does it, he does it right after, not you know, within a couple of days, of when he heals the blind man simply by saying, your sins are forgiven, I forgive your sin. Okay, now again, you got to understand, he is starting to really upset the powers to be. They're making their fortune, their identity is controlling the people. They understand as... They can do whatever they want to their own citizens as long as they don't get them stirred enough, as long as they placate to the Romans, to the deep state. The Romans are the deep state. 
Can't do anything without them, they tell you. So he set up the Pharisees, he's upset them all at this point. By telling them that I forgive your sins, he's taking a bunch of the priests out of business. Because you've got to you got to blow trumpets for me. He's upsetting him as he goes down the road. Now what happens, these people begin to think, uh-oh, uh-oh, we got to get rid of this guy. we got to get rid of this guy. So each one of the Gospels talks about how they get together and how they plan on getting rid of Jesus. I'm going to read John. It's an interesting thing. John 11, 45 to 50. Now they understand what's going on. Lazarus has been laid from the dead. The, men's, the man's been blind healed. He's turned over their tables. He's exposed their fraudulence. Now these religious leaders, all of them, who've never agreed on anything, agree on this one thing. Let's kill Jesus. He's threatening our market. He's threatening our positions. He's threatening our power. We can't manipulate these people. We can't lie to these people. We can't move these people at our whim. We can't get our money off these people. He's setting up the whole thing. And many of the Jews had come to Mary and they had seen what Jesus had done and they believed in Jesus. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and they told them the things that Jesus did. And the chief priests, the Pharisees, they gathered with the council and said, what are we going to do? This man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans, check this out, the Romans will come and take away our places. What am I worried about? I'm worried about position of power. I'm worried about my title. I'm worried about how much money I can make. They're going to come and take away our places, guys. We can't let this, and they'll take away our nation. Caiaphas, being the high priest, stands up and he says, Hey, 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 hey. Consider this. That it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people. And not that the whole nation should perish. He's only worried about his own back pocket and his own authority. Now this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not only for the nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. And from this very day on, they plotted to put Jesus to death. Now one of the things you're going to see in Scripture is that, okay, now how are we going to get him? Well, they make some false charges. They say he's trying to upset Rome. They bring him. Now the people are really confused. These are the people that on Sunday were saying, Messiah, Messiah, David's come, the son of David. We're, we've read Zechariah, man. We did that in our morning devotion. We did that in our evening devotions. Oh, man, we are skipping down the streets. Love is good. Romans are going to start dying. God's going to send that death angel. And just boom, boom, boom. They're all going to start dying. All these wicked people are going to start moving out of the way. That's paraphrased. But I don't know about you, but I can imagine that's what they're looking forward to. How do you like being under a corrupt government? How would you like being under a government that despised you and felt they were smarter than you? How would you like a government to take away your rights? Just because they could. This is what the Jews felt on that. And then, Jesus comes. And he doesn't kill the Romans. 
he does upset more of the establishment, the deep state, by exposing them. And when the deep state has to be is exposed, what do they do? They kill you. They don't have a choice. And so what does it say they plan to do? And from that day on, they plotted to kill him. Now, eventually, they bring him before Pilate. And what's interesting, the Bible says this. The Bible says the priest, and the, 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 priest, the scribes, worked up and told the people, the peons, what to do. This is how you need to feel. He didn't do as he promised. He promised he was going to come and wipe out the Romans. He was going to reestablish the kingdom of David. He didn't promise anything such thing. But that's what they thought. Because that's how they interpreted Scripture. He came to bring peace. He allowed himself to be delivered up. That's why they were so easy, in my opinion. By the way, this is my opinion. I want to get this straight. I'm talking about human beings who have their hopes set on something, who read scriptures a certain way, people who live and love God, who believe the word of God, believe in the power of God, have seen the miracles of God. <coughs> this is how we read it, and it doesn't turn out the way we thought it was going to. What would we have done if we were part of that crowd? Jesus didn't defeat the Romans. He didn't dissolve the unfair tax system. He never put the common person in charge of the government or cared about the common person. And they didn't see how it was. Pilate knew he had a problem on his hand. It was his custom on that holy day to release a prisoner. Barbarios, known disturber of Rome, rebellious, leader of rebellion. Or Jesus. And the high chief, and, and by the way, in John and in Mark and Jesus, look at how many are listed. Everybody in the deep state is listed in wanting to kill Jesus. Because he's messed with them all. He just exposed them. And they convinced the people. You see, it's interesting to me, and I understand having read portions of this book. Why? Can you imagine how exciting it was? First of all, how dreadful it was to watch Pontius Pilate come in the Western Gate with his hundreds of troops and his horns blaring, his drums pounding, and everybody stepping, power and might. Roman army didn't step around you, they stepped on you. And then at the other city gate, even before he gets to the gate, comes Jesus who's doing all these miracles. People have already gone before him. Zechariah 9, here he comes. The son of David, save us. And then come Thursday, Friday, what they expected to happen didn't happen, and so they're frustrated. If I was in Jerusalem that day, and I had seen both processions passing by, what have I do? What would have I done on Friday? Because that's the choice you and I make every day. To choose power and might. <clears throat> to choose to do what we are told by some 
is right and it isn't right? Or to choose love? To choose, are we going to follow the ways of the Lord or the convenient ways? Joshua said it, as for me and my house, we will follow the Lord. Somebody has to make that point, we will follow the Lord. That song says he's never let us down. He's never let us down, but I felt at times like he let me down. I felt at times that things happened to me that I had done everything I was supposed to do. I had done everything what I felt was biblically right. When we lost our house overlooking the ocean, we, did, we, we didn't do anything that we weren't supposed to do. It was signed, sealed into contract. Everything was there. We were ripped off. I called the president of the bank. I'll go borrow money from a relative and, and I'll pay the, pay the you know, okay, okay, if you'll do that, $17,000. The rears, because the people had moved months before we realized it, had taken everything out of our home, put a pole, had charged $10,000 against our home at the local lumber store. Built all kinds of stuff without permits. Tore stuff apart. Took $5,000 just in drapes. And then I'm there and nothing's getting... I'm trying to be... Because they're Christians. And so I borrow the money and... Then they foreclose on the house rather than waiting. And he buys my house and moves into it. I thought, Lord, what's going on? We did every, I mean, you promised. I know we had words. But you know, there are some times you've got to let just God take care of it. Because he's got a plan. Am I going to grow through that? Am I going to learn to forgive some people? And let it go? How's that changed my attitude about what I expect God to do? You owe me a house. <laughs> See, I, th th those are one of those things where I don't understand. And the people, I, I believe the Jews of Jerusalem didn't understand. They didn't understand. And I'll tell you what, when you don't understand, you might want to be like Job. Hey, if anybody got a raw deal, it's Job. My goodness, what a raw deal. He's doing everything right, the most righteous man on earth at that point. Well, let me just afflict him. Let me take his wife, his kids, let me kill everybody, take his money, let him have boils on his body, let him sit, and then we'll see. And what does he say in the middle of that? Though he slay me, I will serve him. Let me read you another at the end of that verse. Though he slay me, yet I will trust him. Even so, I'll defend my own ways before him. I acknowledged, as far as I knew, I didn't do anything unethical, immoral, or illegal when I lost my house. In fact, I went just the opposite way with grace. Job goes on to say, not only will I defend my ways before him, He's still my salvation. For a hypocrite will not come before him. Look, if I don't get what I want from God, am I going to turn from God? I'm going to, no, no. I'm going to acknowledge that I'm, God, I'm not God and he is. See, that's what Palm Sunday, I struggled for years with how could they do this? But then when you get older, you go through more things in life and you begin to understand. I could say, especially if all their leaders 
All the leaders were telling him, oh, no, you've got to get rid of him, you've got to get rid of him. He's promised you. And, and they're the ones who fed the stuff, who fanned the flames. I have a whole different attitude about the Jewish people who called out for Jesus' crucifixion. Not the Pharisees and leaders. But by the way, one of the passages in Acts is really good. Remember the thousands and thousands that come to the Lord in the first couple of chapters of Acts? Go find the phrase, and not, a, not just a few were priests and Sadducees. For a hypocrite will not come before him. Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone turns their back, my soul has no pleasure in them. Hebrews 10.38 Romans 8.28 For all things work together to those that all things work together for good to those that love God to those who are called according to His purposes. Amen? So let's have a little bit of grace for the Sunday Friday Christian. Let's recognize in our own life when things don't work out like we want them to work out. And we think we've done what we're supposed to do. And we've prayed the right prayer. And we've claimed the right promises. And we've named it and claimed it, bind it and grind it. Just like we think we're supposed to do. And it still doesn't turn out the way we want it. Then we better just understand that God's working His own plan for our good. All things work together for good to those that love God and those that are called according to His purposes. So let's have some grace for those people. It's, 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 it, it, I, 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 most likely you people are much more mature than I am. You've never struggled. What was wrong with those people? I now understand them as I understand. Maybe it's God's grace. We're getting older. We've had more experiences. But God is faithful. He will never let us down. Amen? Let's stand and pray. Father, we thank You that though at times it looks like what we expected You to do doesn't come like we expected it, You're still Lord and You still love us. You're still God. Father, I, I want to pray for those who are in dis discouraged this morning. You, you've expected God to do something in your life. Maybe somebody even promised you God would do it for you. It still hasn't come about yet. I want to say that God's not done. He knows your dreams. And it, the Bible says it's His delight to fulfill those dreams. When those dreams come from Him, they will be fulfilled. Be not weary in well-doing. For if you do not quit, you will reap the reward. You need to hang on to that right now. No matter what's roaring about you, accusation, God is on the throne and He's not done. And nobody, nobody, nothing can compete with Him. And nothing can withstand His might and His power. Amen. Amen.